Good to see you. Today we're in uh, Mark chapter 8. And um, so you'll want to read that because I didn't do all of Mark chapter 8 tonight and uh, uh, today. And I'll tell you why that is here in a minute. So, you know, we see that. How many of you have ever seen that version, Willy Wonka? Okay, yeah, you have. It's a thousand years old. Well, when it came out, it was not very popular. That's what's so funny. But um, anyway, so we see Veruca and everybody sees her. Anybody here love her? She's just their favorite person in the world, right? No, not unless you're a liar. But, but do you realize that everybody in that video is selfish and self-centered? All the folks in that room? The, the daughter's self-centered. We see that. She wants what she wants when she wants it. So that's obvious. But the dad is so desperate to want his daughter to like him, he's unwilling to discipline her. And the mother apparently has just given up. You're going to be very unpopular here, right? So we see that in the big picture and we think, oh, there's a selfish person. You can identify it. Let me tell you something about us. In our flesh, without God's spirit, even if we hide it really well from others, we are selfish and self-centered. In our flesh, God says there's nothing good that dwells in us in our flesh. And that's why we need God's spirit. We can pretend to care about others, but if we're not walking in his spirit, if we're not allowing God to fill our lives, even us caring about others really has more to do with their reaction to us. And you know how you can tell? When you do something for somebody else and they don't respond the way you want them to, how do you react? When I was a kid, I was probably about four years old. I've tried to figure out the age. I think so because my brother was in the shopping cart and I was next to the shopping cart in the five and dime store. Now, if you don't know what a five and dime store is, just to give you the modern value, that was like the dollar store. Things didn't just cost five and dime, by the way, but uh, uh, it always smelled like uh, mothballs in there. But I can remember we were leaving the five and dime store and I was next to the cart. And as we came up to the cash register on the right was that candy section for those impulse buys. And right there was Jujubee's. Now, if you don't know what jujubes are, I'm going to tell you what they are. They are a candy that if you eat after you are 30, you are now going to visit the dentist. Because it has removed some of your teeth. It was, I don't know what it was made of, but if you chewed on jujube, what well, was good when you gave it to your kids is they didn't talk for a while because their teeth were stuck together with the jujubes. So I grabbed a thing of jujubes and I said, Mom, I want these. And my mom said, no, you can't have them. And instead of putting them back, I put them in my pocket headed out to the car. When we got to the car, of course, as a little kid, I just pulled out the jujubes and started to eat them. And my mom reached around and, and did what every Southern mom knows how to do, grab you by your arm and spank you at the same time while retrieving you and taking you back into the store. She took me back into the store where I had to confess what I'd done to the manager and pay for the jujubes. And then I believe she threw them away just to teach me a lesson. Never stole again. And here's the deal. We look at that and we see that selfishness and we think I would never be like that. But the truth for all of us is we have that in us. And when we look at Mark chapter 8, what I did is I took one of the sections and actually put it out of order because I want to show you the negative part first and then the positive part. The things where we get it wrong, but then what we need to do. And we're going to end with the most painful part, which is what it means to take up our cross daily. Can we lay down our pride? Can we lay down our selfishness? As Americans, let's be honest, can we lay down our comfort to make Christ first in our lives? Can we take up our cross? So here's two ways we make life about ourselves. I started to name this message, How Humanism Sneaks Into the Church, but I thought it's just way too much work. Number one, I want God to give me what I want when I want it. I've worked in churches long enough to know that there is a tendency, and I always, for the new members class, show the life-saving station video. Because there is a tendency as Christians, even in church, for us to develop a country club mentality. You know, at first we want to reach people outside of the church, but then we say, how can we make church more comfortable for me? And we believe it's about what songs we want to sing. We believe it's about what kind of chairs we want to sit in. How we, can we make things that I like and that I want to do? And that's a country club 
mentality. There was a group of people that had that. In Mark chapter 8, verse 11 to 13, Jesus, by the way, at the beginning of this chapter, he had done miracles. And if you look, chapter 7 and chapter 8 are very similar, but they're different. And I believe the reason that that Mark did this is he did chapter 7 with three very similar stories, feeding, healing. And then chapter 8, to show how slow the disciples were, which gives me lots of hope. Because I see the disciples with Jesus and they're like, what did that mean? And I read my Bible and I'm like, what did that mean? The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. And they asked him for a sign from heaven. By the way, Jesus had already been healing and (laughs) fed and... But, you know, they wanted uh, a bread from heaven, I guess. It wasn't exactly the miracle they wanted. They wanted a miracle that they wanted, not the miracle he had done. You need to do a miracle the way I want you to do a miracle. He sighed deeply. If you're a parent, you know exactly what that... Can we go ahead and just try that sigh that you make when you're just disappointed in your children? Or your children do something and you're just like, you ready? One, two, three. Yeah, not bad. You got it. You got it. And it's the same sound that a teenager makes when they're disappointed with us, right? So he sighed deeply and he said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got in back into the boat and crossed to the other side. See, we tend to say, do what I want when I want you to do it. In the Old Testament, there's these guys that VeggieTales likes to call Rack Shack and Benny. We call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which actually is their foreign names, but it's a lot easier to say than their real names, I'll be honest. In Daniel chapter 3, 16 through 20, they're told to bow before an idol. And here's what they say to the king. They said, you know, we're not going to do that, and our God will save us. And then they say this, which is amazing. Even if he doesn't, we won't bow to you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we really want God to save us, but guess what? Even if he doesn't do what we want, when we want, we're not going to serve you. I am sure when they were being flung into the fire, which would have been below them, they would have walked up a hill, the guards died as they were thrown. I'm sure as they were flying in the air, they were thinking, well, I guess we're not getting our prayer answered this time. But God knew what he was doing when he wanted to do it. We don't always get what we want when we want. Number two, I want God to do things my way. God, I want this job. I want this situation to work out. I want you to heal my friend. What happens when you pray for somebody that you really care about and they're not healed? Does God not matter to you anymore? If you lose your faith because God doesn't do what you want, you have Santa Claus God, not real God. You have genie God, not real God. And so I skipped ahead in the story just to show you how we can get it wrong. Peter had just said, you're the Messiah. (laughs) And then he's going to tell Jesus how to be the Messiah. How's that for good? Don't we like to tell God what to do? By the way, if if you know what this is like, you've prayed for your football or baseball or basketball team before. God, help them to win. I I mean, we can pray whatever we want, but you need to understand, I I think in heaven they're like, really, he's praying about that? He really needs to pray about his driving, right? So he began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things. So Peter says, hey, listen, you're you're the Messiah. I believe in you. And so then Jesus tells him, hey, just so you know, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. I love this. You know that Peter, when he was telling Mark this story, made sure this part was put in here. Listen to this sentence. He spoke plainly about this. Peter's basically saying, yeah, we just didn't get it over and over. By the way, God never fails you. You realize that, right? He just gives you a retake. I've had lots of retakes. And so he says he spoke plainly and Peter took him aside. Jesus, I know you're the Messiah. Let me tell you how to do this and rebuked him. Jesus, I want to tell you how to be Messiah. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. By the way, you can't get a lot bigger rebuke than this. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Do we pray for God's will or our will? You know, Jesus, when he was going to the cross, said, not my will, but your will be done. Too often, if we're honest, we pray our will. 
And sometimes we just need to be honest and say, God, I want you to heal this person. I want you to give me this job. Lord, I want you to work out this situation. Lord, I want this not to happen in my life. God, I don't want my friend to suffer. But God, I know that if they do, your will be done. And when we get into selfishness and our own lust and our own ways of looking at life, we love comfort. We don't want to be uncomfortable. As Americans, we, we, we're the most air-conditioned, and we complain. We, we complain that we have to stay home. Have you looked at our homes compared to the world? I mean, there are people right now that are in a hut somewhere with no power, no running water, no sewer, and we're like, I can't believe I've only got 143 channels. And yet we don't think we're selfish and self-centered. It is so easy in our flesh to slip into that. There's nothing good in our flesh. But here's the good news. Here's ways we can make life about Jesus. And I'm going to talk about the first two very quickly. Before Jesus rebuked him, listen to the story of what happened. So number one, by the way, we need to remember who Jesus is. Have you ever met somebody famous? What's the most famous person you've met? You can yell it out. John Cena. The Dalai Lama. Okay. Garth Brooks. Don't break my heart. Anybody else? Meet somebody famous? Come on. Who? Billy Graham. You got to say Billy Graham. I can't do a Billy Graham impression. Keith Richards. I know somebody here who met Shaquille O'Neal. Eric Brookins. Thank you. Thank you. So... Yeah, I hear you. Should be depressed if that's the most famous. But anyway, so, so one day I was leaving school, and uh, I was in the band room, and I was heading out of the band room. And as I head out of the band room, I see Bob Greasy, the Bob Greasy. Now, if you're not a Dolphin fan, you have no idea who I'm talking about, but he used to be famous. And I was leaving. I saw Bob Greasy. Had no idea what to say to him. So here's what I said. Are you Bob Greasy? Yeah, I'm, I'm Bob Greasy. His nephew went to our school, so he had come to pick up his nephew for whatever reason. And I just walked past him. As I walked past him, I thought, you need to say something else. He is alone, standing, nobody around him. He's just standing there waiting for his nephew. He's not doing a thing. Go back and say something. Now, I'm in eighth or ninth grade, so I walked back and I said, thanks for all the great wins. That was it. I had nothing. He's like, oh, okay, thank you, okay. And I just walked off like a dork. <laughs> now, it's funny when you get around somebody who you think's important, how you act a little differently, and maybe you pay a little more attention. Listen, you know the author of the universe, and yet sometimes you and I don't pay attention. You have a direct connection to the one who was there in the beginning. If you read Genesis chapter 1, it says, we... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were there in the beginning. Jesus is eternal, everlasting. So when you're praying, you're praying to the most famous, just to use a, that, the word famous almost degrades him a little bit because it's so much bigger than just being famous. And yet sometimes we don't pay attention. So we need to remember who he is. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? He started with an easy question. It's very good. This is, by the way, if you want people to open up, start with an easy question. Don't start with the second question. Start with the first one. Who do people, what do people say about this? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Now, there's a direct question. And you can almost see the other disciples go, mm -hmm. boy, my sandals need to be replaced. You got lots of, what did we walk in? Did you? There were lots of camels out today, weren't there? I mean, you just, you know. But Peter, who I always call the ADD disciple, he was at least the most outspoken. He was the impulsive one, needed Ridlin. And Peter says, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone. Peter realized who he was. And we, of course, know by looking back that his next discussion with Jesus is... You know, that's not really the way to be the Messiah, right? And don't we do the same thing? 
We need to realize who Jesus is and that he knows what he's doing. And even on the days when we feel like, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand how you're working that we first understand who he is. That's the reason, by the way, that singing in worship, by the way, worship is just when you turn your hearts towards God, when you praise him and you thank him. It doesn't have to be through singing, but this is a way that we do it. And as humans, it's a great way that we do it because it reminds us of who he is. And when you're reminded of who he is, guess what? Your problems begin to fade. I'm not saying your problems aren't big. They're huge. But not in the light of somebody who said, all the stars be created now. Jesus with God at the beginning. Remember, more than any famous person you've ever met, you know the author of the universe as a believer. Number two, remember what Jesus says about you. Remember what Jesus says about you. Now, Steve referred to that just a little bit. I'm going to give you a few more verses about that. But listen, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. What we had to do, by the way, we had to go over to Matthew to find the rest of the story. It's like the Paul Harvey version. Last night I said Paul Harvey, and some of the kids said, Yeah, Steve Harvey? You mean Steve Harvey? I'm like, no, no, Paul Harvey did not do Family Feud. Right? I had to tell them who Paul Harvey was and then get my cane out. Get my Grecian formula out. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. So before the rock was the rock, Peter was the rock. And by the way, Peter was a wrestler too. You'll see he wrestled in the garden. He, he was a sword fighter. On this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades, that's hell, will not overcome it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he orders his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. See, all through the Bible, Jesus is telling Peter who he is, but we sometimes forget who we are. And there's a balance of this. Listen, listen, we can be over here and think, hey, listen, I'm awesome. I got my whole act together. I'm never selfish. I'm never self-centered. I don't, you know. And this is denial, right? So we need to confess our sins. But then we also need to confess who we are in Christ. Let me just give you a few verses that talk about who we are. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says you're a new creation. Revelation 2.17 says you have a new name. Romans 8.38 says you are forever loved. Isaiah 53 says you are healed because he was pierced. Isaiah 53.5, by the way. 1 John 2, you're God's forgiven children. You ever feel like the outcast? You're one of his children. You're adopted, Ephesians 1.5, not abandoned. You are complete, Colossians 2.10. You feel like you're missing something? Isaiah 43, 1, you've been found and redeemed. Joshua 1, 9, you're not alone. John 15, 11, you can have joy. Some of you forgot that. When I used to work at Quincy's after church, can I tell you that a lot of Christians forgot that? The saddest people that ever came in that restaurant were people who left church. I thought, I don't know what church you just went to, but they gave you persimmons. And if you don't know what persimmons are, you've probably got more joy than the other people in this room. You have power, love, and a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 7. And you're eternal, John 3, 16. What? He gave you eternal life. Now, let's get to the hardest part of the message. Remember, life is not about you. One of our young men welded this cross. He's in elementary school learning to weld. His parents are teaching him how to weld already. I can't even change the oil in my car without messing up the entire driveway. I'll just be honest with you. And the, one of the first things he made was a cross. And we look at the cross and we have a cross on the wall here. There used to be a cross back there on the wall. And when we took it down, on the back of it were a bunch of horseshoes. And I said, throw that away. They said, you want to throw it away? Why are you throwing away a cross? Because we don't believe in Jesus and luck. We don't believe in Jesus and do this. Chunk it. We don't believe in those horseshoes. We're not going to have worldly symbols messing up the cross. 
Now, I don't know if you watch. Anybody in here ever watch Deadliest Catch? If you don't know it, sailors are very superstitious. Su- superstitious. And there's a, one of the guys who runs a ship, one of the captains of the ship, his name is Keith. One of my favorite captains. He's the most passionate I mean, he cusses at those guys with love. I can just see it in his face. Is he? That whole show, by the way, is beep, beep, beep. Reminds me of my childhood. My mom's like, your dad never talked to you that way. I said, not around you. My sister says, it's like you grew up in a different home. I said, we did. My brother and I went to work with my dad. The girls didn't. Dad had a different personality at work, and it involved lots of language. Colorful, colorful language. I know how to use cuss words in strings that you've never heard, but that has nothing to do with the sermon. All right. So, so Keith, every season, before the first pots go into the, to catch the crabs, he knocks on wood. He hits all his bobbleheads. He, if he had salt, he'd throw it over his shoulder. If he could, he'd bury a little thing in his front yard. Somehow he thinks that he has something to do with helping God or helping the sea gods or whatever he believes in to do something. He thinks that if I do these extra things, then suddenly God will love me more. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the same way. They thought if I wear really long tassels, if I put this on my head, but I don't love, it's okay because I did these religious things that make me better. But it's not about us. By the way, you've experienced this if you've ever been watching a football game or a basketball game or or some type of sport and you walked out of the room and your team scored. Just like that commercial, you thought, well, maybe it's because I walked out of the room. Maybe somehow I have something to do. And you don't. Okay, let me just. But here's the big test. Because people love to call themselves Christians until it comes to really meaning the cross. People love to wear the cross on their necklace, put it on their wall, wear earrings. But do we really even know what it means anymore? I mean, can you imagine in Florida wearing an electric chair around your neck? It'd be weird. Well, that's what this represented. Death. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. And he said, whoever wants to be my disciple might, no, could, possibly if they feel like it, on their best day, you know, no, must deny themselves. What does deny myself mean? It means I don't look at my interests first. I'm not the dad in that video. I'm not Veruca Salt in the video. I'm not the passive mom in the video who says, well, whatever you guys want to do. I deny myself. I say, God, what do you want me to do? By the way, you still have a personality. Denying yourself doesn't mean you don't have a personality. You are still who God made you to be. Some of you are very outspoken. Some of you are very quiet. Some of you are very outgoing. Some of you would rather be, you love COVID. You're just like, I can be alone. Thank you. Others of you are like, I just can't stand it. I haven't hugged somebody in so long. I'm hugging myself, right? We're all different. But that denying ourselves means you don't look at your interests first. And then it says, take up their cross. What does that mean? It means a death sentence to yourself, to your selfishness, to your comfort, to your desires. Take up your cross and follow me. Why? For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. When Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. That's what this is. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, our God will save us, but you know what? If he doesn't, we're still going to serve him. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, that's the good news of who Jesus is, will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So we look at our life and we say, God, it's not about me. God, what does it mean to bear my cross in life? Let me give you some examples. Bearing a cross could be forgiving somebody who doesn't deserve it. Forgiveness is one of the most difficult things in the world. You know who said that? Mr. Rogers. Did you know that? In his book, he says the hardest thing on earth is forgiving. That's Mr. Rogers. 
If he has a hard time, the, the mellowest, nicest man on earth, if he has a hard time forgiving, can I tell you something about us? We do too. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a big slide. It can just be something small. Can I deny myself to say, God, what do you want me to do? Now, this doesn't mean take, letting people take advantage of you. Remember, the dad was also selfish in the video. And it doesn't mean to be passive and not worry about anybody else. The mom was also wrong in the video. But it means that we can't go around always demanding our rights and thinking that we're taking up our cross to follow him. We don't always get the things we want, but are we looking for what God wants? And when we do this, this verse ends with, you'll be my witnesses. Why? Because when you really begin to follow God and put yourself on the cross... And say, I'm going to sacrifice my desire, my will to yours. By the way, being a Christian is not just knowing about Jesus. It's not just knowing about the cross. It's not just understanding. It's not even wearing jewelry that says crosses. or It's not even doing religious activities. It's saying, Jesus, I know in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. The Messiah, who Peter testifies here, that whoever believes in him, and that word belief doesn't mean a mental knowledge. It means to trust in, like I trust in this chair. I sat down, I fully trust the chair. Now I study the chair, I know about the chair, but I've now surrendered to the chair. Whoever surrenders to him will not perish but have eternal life. When you say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again to take the penalty for my sins, because in my flesh, I'm just like that little girl. I'm selfish and self-centered. I want what I want. And God, when I confess that you are the Messiah and I surrender my life to you, the Bible says the great exchange takes place. And he takes your sin. And he gives you his righteousness. You're right with God, not because of anything you do, not because you bang on stuff or throw salt on your shoulder or pray a certain way or get everything right. You know why? By grace, we've been saved through faith. When you trust him, when you take up your cross and follow him. So how can we be a follower? Number one, we deny ourselves. That means we confess, we're honest with God. We, we stop selfish sin. We spend time in prayer. Number two, we take up our cross. That's difficult obedience. Anybody can be a Christian when it's easy, but when life gets hard, when there's less and less Christians in the world, when they begin passing laws that make it difficult, more and more difficult to be Christian. By the way, out in California right now, a church is being sued for meeting. Even though restaurants are open in that same area. Do you think there's going to be a bent towards that in the future? Yeah. Can we stand up and do what God wants us to do, even if it's painful? We have to read scripture and see, what does God want me to do? And then number three, can I follow him? Can I seek his will? And how do you do that? You allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. So that means when you're in a store, you're dealing with somebody, or you're talking to a friend, or or you're just hanging out one day, you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and say, hey, maybe you should call so-and-so. Why don't you check on this person? I cannot tell you the number of times that I have been doing Whatever, mowing the grass, watching TV, and all of a sudden I felt like I really need to call so and so. And I've called that person, (laughs) sweaty, if you could see, covered with grass, sweat coming off my head. And I thought, I need to call Billy Bob. So I call Billy Bob and I say, Billy Bob, how you doing? I can't believe you called me today. Can you see me? You don't know what just happened. And then they tell me what just happened. And I go, well, I knew I was supposed to call you. I didn't know why. So God must have wanted you to know that somebody cares about you and that he cares about you. So listen to those promptings of the Holy Spirit. Listen when the Holy Spirit tells you to run away from a situation. If you're a teenager and you're watching online, let me tell you sometimes. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, the best thing he says to you is run. Walk away. You got to know when to hold them. Right? You never knew the Holy Spirit was... Kenny Rogers, did you? Follow him. Can you seek him at all times? Can we lay down our pride, our selfishness, our self-centered, our comfort to really take of his cross? What does God want you to do in this world that is selfish and self-centered? They are falling more and more for a humanistic philosophy which says, there's good in me. You appreciate the good and I'm going to demand you appreciate the good. And as Christians, we go, I'm demanding what God wants. God, what do you want? I surrender all to you. Can you do that today?
If you're here today or watching online and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you about what it means. I explained it a little bit. And if you want to take that next step of faith, you can pray a simple prayer which says, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I confess all my sins to you, knowing you died on a cross and rose again. And I surrender from this day forward my life to you. If you're a Christian and the truth is, there was a time where you were walking with the cross, but, but lately you've been more about selfishness and self-centeredness, maybe it's time to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for walking on my own. And Father, help me to take up my cross and follow you. Deny myself. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for each one that's here, each one that's outside, each one that's watching online. We pray today that you would be honored in all that's said and done. And Father, this message is so easy to talk about. The cross, all you did, the horrible death you died, nails driven into your hands, dropped into a hole, left to suffocate, bleeding. And Father, you've asked that we take up our cross by being inconvenienced, by denying ourselves, by surrendering our will to yours. Lord, may we recognize what you've done for us and willingly carry our cross with you. Thank you for the cross you've given us, Lord. Thank you for your cross. Father, I pray that would be true of each of us. In Jesus' name, amen.